Evening, everybody, and welcome to uh, the Retina debate. We've got a fantastic program this evening. Um, we're going to be talking about complement inhibition, and then we're going to be talking about biosimilars. We've got uh, superb speakers from um, from India, Spain, the USA, and Italy, and I'm being uh, co-hosted, co-chaired with Nicole Etta, my colleague on the board. Um, it's a great pleasure to uh, have everybody here, and I hope you all enjoy it. Please do use the Q and A in order to, to um, submit questions. We'll be uh, monitoring that during it and trying to put the best ones forward um, uh, for, for discussion by the panel. And we hope it's going to be lively. So I think we should just go straight ahead, introduce our fantastic colleague, Jorge Mones from, um, from Spain, uh, who's going to be talking about complement inhibition and whether it's important or not in geographic atrophy. Thank you very much indeed, Jordi. Thank you, and, and it's my pleasure to participate in this debate, favoring complement inhibition uh, to treat geographic atrophy, and it's a privilege to do it uh, against uh, JM body. Uh, it's not been the first time, many years ago, we did it also. So these are my financial disclosures, and many of them are related to complement uh, companies. So, uh, GA is a devastating, non-treatable condition that causes blindness in few years. Sometimes in just four years, it can go from 20 to 100, 20 to 20 to 2400. At least 25% of eyes with 2050 or better decline to 20 to 100 or worse by four years. And it's estimated that approximately 25% of legal blindness in UK and 20% in US are caused by GA. There is uh, histopathological evidence that supports the role for complement dysfunction in geographic atrophy and AMD pathogenesis, as well as genetic evidence support role for complement dysfunction. There are many trials that have been targeting the complement pathway. And recently I had the chance of seeing the main concerns of, of Professor Ambadi in another virtual debate, and I will try to explain some of them. He's questioning if all anti-PGF trials have failed and only one succeed if we would believe that anti-PGF is a really working drug for wet. Well, unlike neovascular MD, that all therapies target the same protein in GA trials, targets are different. The same pathway, but different targets. So in phase two trials, Philly NTC3 and Gather1 NTC5, uh, monthly uh, therapy show reduction of lesions growth between 27 and 29%. There was a dose dependent CMB induction that we'll talk about later. The rest were the safety was similar to uh, intravitreal uh, therapies. Recently, we had the phase three results of uh, Oaks and Derby. Uh, at Derby, 18 months, it was a 13% reduction, and in Oaks, it was a 22%. This is another concern of professors and body. If this anatomic benefit is real, true, or it's less, and he says that it could be around 6%, and I'll try to explain that it's probably not 6%. First of all, the numbers are not precise because baseline lesions for uh, uh, Derby and Oaks were around eight, not around four. The other reason is that if we calculate the percentage of difference of the final lesions, the absolute lesion, this is like calculating from day zero. And we need to calculate the percentage difference from the day the lesions were treated because before there was no treatment. So since that day, then it's a 20% and not a 6%. And this emphasizes that we need to treat patients as early as, as possible to get maximum benefit. Another proof that these drugs work is that the treatment not only were superior than, fel uh, sorry, than sham eyes, they were superior than fellow eyes. And that happens in Derby uh, and not happen in the sham group here. Uh, your and your uh, uh, left, uh, your right, sorry, and uh, also in oaks. When lesions uh, were extrafoil in a subset of patients that lesions were extrafoil, the, the effect of reduction could be up to 33%. Also, when artificial intelligence detected those eyes that were fast progressors, that was done by Ursula Smith, the, uh, these cases showed an increased benefit of therapy. And the fourth quartile that has the fastest progression, uh, progressing lesions, these reductions of, of growth could reach 
the anti-C5 therapy, the phase two of asincapigol, uh, also showed reductions of 28 and almost uh, 30%. When the lesions were far more than 0.25 from the foveal center, these reductions could reach 31%, even 35%. And when these lesions were even far from the fovea, these reductions could reach even 50%. So the more uh, far from the fovea, probably because of different phenotypes, the best uh, treatment effect. Also with anti-C5 therapy, there was a reduction in the progression from irora to serora, as well a reduction from drusen to irora and serora. So there was a decreased rate of progression from intermediate AMD too late AMD GA. So another professor's and body concern is why Philly, uh, sorry, why Oaks and Derby have not presented any functional data. If that, that was some sort of mystery that microperimeter was not presented, this is just because these visual functional endpoints were pre-specified to be presented at 24 months, which we have not yet arrived there. Regarding safety, there was an increased incidence of CMB in both drugs. The rest was consistent with other intravitreal therapies regarding endophthalmitis, inflammation, no cases of vasculitis, no cases of occlusive uh, arterial disease. There was something that took the attention of professors and body, which is these uh, three cases of optic ischemic neuropathy and papilledema. The, he uh, hypothesizes that this, this could be related to C3 inhibition. However, this might not be specific to C3 inhibition because it's been reported that with repeated intravital injections of anti-VGF, there is also an increased risk of ischemic optic neuropathy. The safety profile of GATHER1 and TC5 was very consistent also with regular trials besides the CMB, and there were no cases of optic uh, neuro ischemic neuropathy. These drugs, they do have a dose-dependent incidence of CMB. And for example, in Oaks and Derby, at 18 months, it was almost 10% uh, in every month, 6% in every other month versus 3% in SHAP. However, there were no significant changes in visual acuity due to these neovascular lesions. In addition, most of these lesions were occult, uh, type 1 lesions, more than 95%, and the majority more than 50% had no subretinal fluid. So these lesions were not aggressive CMBs that caused visual loss. So we can exclude them as a source of visual loss. So, and the most legitimate concern of professors and body, which is not harm first, if a treatment has not much benefit and a lot of uh, complications, okay, that's, that's a legitimate concern that we all ha have to have. But with confidence, I can say this is not the case seeing the consistent efficacy of these two drugs and seeing the safety profile of these drugs, these patients will have benefit reducing the progression of their lesions without paying a price for additional side effects. So a stake home messages, atrophic AMD is a devastating disease that causes blindness and a true increase in epidemic in developed countries. Robust histopathological and genetic evidence supports the role of complement dysfunction in AMD pathogenesis. Two different drugs targeting two different proteins of the complement pathway have demonstrated significant reduction of deletion growth from 18 to 28, and depending on patient selections to 30 and 40%. So with this therapy, patient selection will be crucial. Despite these drugs have a dose-dependent effect on causing CMB, most of them were type 1 lesions, majority with no retinal fluid, and were not a cause of visual loss. Safety of intravitreal NTC3 and NTC5 had the usual risk of intravitreal injections and not being a cause of unusual visual loss. And the benefit risk uh, ratio is well favorable to treat patients with geographic atrophy, especially those more at risk of losing vision function due to fast progressing lesions or due to have foveal sparing uh, lesions. Thank you very much. So thank you very much for that. Well, that's um, that's compelling. Uh, so at this point, you're definitely in the lead, Joey. Um, but unfortunately, um, your colleague or combatant, uh, Professor Ambati, is going to come back. 
and so we need to see what uh, what he has to say because you've made a, a very good case for and now we need to to find out what might be the more real world uh implications so here we go great pleasure to have you here thank you very much for the invitation and you know the most um pride i take from my good friend jordi monez is that he actually heard my talk last month and came well prepared for it. So I'm, I'm really happy that somebody listened to my talk. So you clearly have me at a little bit of a disadvantage because I haven't seen your talk earlier, but nevertheless, uh, here we go. <clears throat> so today I'll try to convince you that complement inhibition is not likely to be an important part of our armamentarium in the management of geographic atrophy. Here are my financial disclosures. So as you know, Jordy took the liberty of showing the slide already, I think it, it bears mentioning. Imagine this scenario, really, that suppose Anchor and Marina for wet AMD had failed, and that View 1 and View 2 had failed, and that Hawk also failed, but magically Harrier succeeded. AMD, and I would suggest not. Now, he made the case that, well, you know, complement is different because there are 40 different proteins and each molecule is different and all this kind of stuff. Well, that's true, but the fact of the matter is clinical trials targeting molecules upstream of C3 and downstream of C3 have both failed. So, and in fact, the, the most condemning aspect of this is that the most powerful complement inhibitor that's out there, Eculizumab, Solaris, which blocks 99.99% of complement activation, and it's an approved drug for the most fatal complement disease, PNH, it didn't work. Phil Rosenfeld showed it didn't work, right? So I think we have to bear all of that in mind. And now we've actually come to the point where we've done literally over 100 clinical trials where it's reasonable to expect that some clinical trial would succeed merely by chance in this field over 15, 20 years. And that's exactly the history of complement inhibitor trials, right? So you all know this, Chroma, Spectri failed, all this long laundry list of drugs upstream of C3, downstream of C3, blocking all complement of all failed. And the only notable exception to date is that among the two pivotal trials conducted for this particular C3 inhibitor, Derby did not meet its primary endpoint at 12 months. Now, there's a reason we pick primary endpoints and specify, right? Because we don't get to pick and choose whatever time points we want. And Oaks did meet that primary endpoint at 12 months. So that's what we have to deal with. And based on that, should we believe that complement inhibition works for GA? Well, now that the primary endpoint worked only in one, was achieved only in one of the two trials, the sponsor decided to add their phase two trial, Philly, in their drug application to the FDA. You know, my ch little children play this game when they lose one and they keep saying, okay, let's do two more, best two out of three. I don't know that that's a really, you know, proper approach for assessing clinical trial strategies, picking whichever two or three as we want, and then changing as new data comes at 18 months, saying, oh yes, at 18 months it works, so we'll include that. You know, what if we did it at nine months and it didn't work or 21 months and it didn't work? Should we pick that? And we have to remember that this Philly trial, which did meet its endpoint, had was plagued by a tremendous excess in the number of dropouts in the treatment arm. And at least the initial analyses that were used or presented were this last observation carried forward effect of the artifact that we all know that exaggerates benefit in treatment arms. And really what Philly has taught us is that dropping out of the GA trial is the best way to halt GA progression. And so by picking these different combinations of trials, looking repeatedly at different time points, all this is called statistically multiple bites of the same apple. And this requires adjusting p-values to make them more stringent, but we haven't, at least I haven't seen those analyses. And I would suggest they're taking so many bites of the apple that pretty soon there might be no apple left. Now, Jordy has me at a disadvantage. Some of these data are uh, kind of dated, but the bottom line is, and he agrees with me, that the treated lesions, regardless of the actual baseline and 18 month data, the treated lesions are roughly six to 7% smaller. 
Now, you can say, well, you have to start the clock only from the time of treatment. Well, that's fair enough, but the bottom line is what the patient cares about is, what is my area of atrophy, and more importantly, what is my vision compared to if I didn't do the treatment? You know, if my vision changed from 2200 to 2250, that's that difference is what it is. It's not like, well, I'm comparing to from the time I started. So we have a 6% difference over 18 months after 18 injections, ideally. And that growth rate is about two months of growth. And that's what we're getting taken at face value. And so if you look at these two pictures, I would really challenge people to immediately point out which one is bigger. And that's what you're getting, this 6% difference. So do you think patients can tell that difference? So even taking these data, I think at face value, when we look at the outcomes carefully, the differences are extremely modest. And the questions we all need to ask are, does the drug work at all? If so, how well does it really work? Does it even make a difference for patients? And what harms are done to the patient? And frankly, what patients are more is most interested in and what we should be most interested in as doctors are in fact functional outcomes. And in the Philly trial, the sponsor has shown there is no significant difference at 12 months in best corrected visual acuity under either luminance conditions. And if anything, at 18 months, the sham group was actually numerically better. Now, my good friend Jordy said, well, the pre-specified time points for the phase three trials were really at 24 months. Well, I can't speak to that, except if you go today to the European Clinical Trials Register, you will see when they registered these trials, they said at the endpoints at 12, 24, and 36 months, they would, they would measure visual acuity, low LLD, reading speed, micropermetry, and NEIVFQ25 at 12, 24, and 36 months. Now, I'm only privy to what's there in the public data space. So I invite any of you who are interested to look at the European Union Clinical Trials Register. And so the fact that they haven't shown a difference in the phase three trials to date, really, I suggest, tells us something. And so, you know, if you now look at the exudative AMD events, and my good friend Jordy has really already acknowledged this, we're talking about a four to five times increased risk of exudative AMD. Now you can try to minimize this saying it responds to anti-VEGF, it's not really so bad. Well, you know, the published data from the Philly trial showed more than a handful of patients losing 20 letters, some even losing 48 letters of vision. Admittedly, that was a minority of patients, but I would say that that is not an innocuous uh, risk. Now, I'm not trying to make a big hay out of these four cases. I'm simply reading the data and commenting on it. There were, in fact, four cases in the monthly arm of various optic nerve pathology. I have no idea, and no one has any idea whether this is related to the drug or not. It could be purely by chance, or it could be due to the drug. We just have to be open to the possibility, given that retinal ganglion cell function can be affected by C3 inhibition. So, in conclusion, we have high rates of CNV, possible optic nerve pathology, no benefit to date with any visual functional outcomes. And if I were a patient, I would wonder why even bother with this treatment? And put it bluntly, patients are in fact going blind at home now. And in fact, well, the difference is they would go blind in the clinic. So GA is a very part of our armamentarium, and I would suggest that the data for now say not. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Jaya Krishna. The, the great thing about debates is that everybody can be um, very politely, very rude to their um, to their opponent. And we've no, I'd never be rude to Jordy. He's a very good friend. friend. <laughs> it's um, it's uh, it's brilliant. What a what a great um, renunciation and superbly done. So, Jordy, come on. Um, there's some really good points there, and I think the one that really struck out to me 
is we're looking at the maximum benefit is about two months. So you made a great case for it and you were asked to make a great case for. So how, how would you come back actually in a, a less combative way uh, in order to, 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 to rebut what Jaya Krishna said that we were not in a position to be using it? Yeah, well, it, in trials, uh, trials are intended to approve drugs. And, and many times trials, at the beginning at least, they take very bad cases, long lasting cases. And you don't, for example, we are not able yet to treat patients which have initial GA or late intermediate AMD. You need to prove a lot of safety and efficacy to get into those better seeing eyes. So, of course, if we treat a patient that has a very large lesion, there is no margin of benefit. I will never treat a patient like that because who cares if we get a little benefit because if the lesion is so large as mm -hmm. they presented, even we do a lot of reduction, the lesion will be large also with the reduction. So trials are to prove therapies. Then with our best judgment, we will use those therapies in those patients we consider will do a better uh, function. I will never use these drugs in a patient who has a very large GA, 2400, no way. But if I have a patient that has foveal spear and uh, the GA threatens the fovea, of course I will treat them. So that's why I said that patient selection will be crucial with these therapies. Because patients will not have the feedback of getting benefit. P patients will have to have the faith that they, we are doing something because differently from NTVGF therapy, there is no feedback for anyone. So it's going to be difficult to convince a patient that we're doing a benefit. So it's going to be possible only in those that still have preserved vision. Yeah. Okay. So Jack Krishna, basically what Jordi's said is that the questions were wrong uh, and that this is, this is great stuff, but it should be a completely different population. That is the same patients 10 years earlier. And you do get that ha can be quite compelling because it's the patients and I've been around long enough to see people that I met 10, 15 years ago who had lots and lots of soft drusen, big drusenoid PEDs, and they're now losing vision from progressive GA. So to have had a therapy 10, 15 years ago for those people who have watched over the years developing this would have been fantastic. So it was the wrong question and we should be using them in a different way. How do you respond to that? Yeah, I would agree with both of you. We should be treating patients as early as we can. And so I would encourage Jordi to encourage the sponsors to do that trial, to do that trial in patients with soft drusen, very small foveal sparing lesions, and show us that the drug is effective and we would all jump on it. I would differ a little bit with my friend to saying clinical trials are uh, pursued to approve drugs. That may be the sponsor's perspective. But from a public's perspective, from the regulatory agency, they have no care whether you approve the drug or not. It is to answer a question and whether it meets that primary endpoint or not, right? So if you want to select patients with small lesions, lots of soft drusen, maybe minimal atrophy, foveal sparing, please do that trial and please show that it works because we would all jump on it. Now, if you take the case of anti-VEGF, we have many drugs that work superbly after the blood vessels have already broken through. Now, if we said, well, you know, these drugs should also work to prevent CNV, that sort of conceptually makes sense, except now we know that they don't. They don't work. So similarly, we shouldn't simply think just because there was a 6% reduction with these bigger lesions that it's going to work very well for small lesions or small lesions with just little soft drusen here and there. So to know that, we have to do that trial and then see. Mm -hmm. I have a question for, for, for the both of you, actually. Um, you both have mentioned that uh, there have been other products uh, that have failed uh, in trials. So um, is there um, any reason why, for example, the inhibition of C3 um, would work better than inhibition of C4? five or any other step within the complement cascade? Or in fact, all of them with Solaris, with echolizumab, blocking all complement yeah. activation. Yeah. Well, the yeah. question is uh, if we know exactly what is the dysfunction of complement, I, I would just be humble and say complement dysfunction because 
I, I'm not sure we want to suppress all the complement activity. Maybe that's wrong. So, uh, and, and first we are dealing with the degenerative disease. We're dealing with Alzheimer. We're dealing with something which is just like death. So dealing with death is very difficult. And, and, and this disease is very heterogeneous and it's a tremendous challenge for the trial. So from scratch, the most likelihood that happens in such a difficult disease is that you fail. And it has happened a lot. So I, I'm, not, I'm not surprised that such a difficult disease is not easy to prove a delta in a trial because of the heterogeneity. And I think that the trials, the historical all, all trials, my, uh, criticism I do, is that they do not have a stratified by phenotypes and they have put poodles and greyhounds in the same trial. So if you have poodles in the greyhounds in the same trial, it's difficult to make, but new trials probably will stratify by phenotypes and then you will have clean, uh, more clear data and not noise of these non-progressing lesions. Good. Okay. Um... Jaya Krishna, have you got anything to add or even... Yeah, um... I would just say I'm really glad Jordi brought up Alzheimer's disease. And I think we all know the debacle that happened with Aduhelm, the biogen drug that was approved at a similar basis with different characteristics, amyloid reduction, but not really functional changes, and then changing trials, including other trials, changing time points. The drug was finally approved, but nobody in this country uses it. And now it's pretty much the sponsor has abandoned the drug. We don't need that in geographic atrophy, not only for the sponsor of this trial, but for the field as a whole. We don't need another Aduhelm debacle. I, I need to answer that. And, and just a little bit. Uh, <laughs> you I, brought up Alzheimer's, Jordi. Well, right? I need to answer. And I think that the, the settlement we can do is that these therapies will work for certain patients. And I think that's unquestionable because some patients that still have a lot to be lost, a lot to, lo to lose, those patients will help them. Those lesions that are large, that have already lost a lot, it's not going to pay work to make them come every month. No question with that. But lesions that are younger and smaller, uh, they will benefit. And I agree with you. I, I think that GA is uh, uh, too, too far beyond the line. It's like a cur case. We need to treat the patients before they die, not when they're in the morgue. We need to treat the patients when they are in the intensive care unit. And that's where intermediate uh, AMD is. However, we cannot jump into intermediate AMD, which is even more difficult to prove something because of the duration of the disease. But I agree that these drugs, whenever the efficacy and safety is gaining confidence, they will get closer to, to earlier, earlier stages. That's gonna be the best. I would just say one final thing, Jordi. I believe what the data are, right? The data are that Derby met the endpoint and Oaks did not, which means if you're in the United States, you should take it. And if you're in the rest of the world, you shouldn't. That's what it says, right? <laughs> well, but then you have Gather. Gather is that, that is what the clinical well, trial showed us. Then, but don't forget Gather. Gather is another arm. It's another trial that showed uh, robust uh, efficacy. And it's not part of the NDA submission here, though. No, of course not. And yeah. but uh, overall, the, maybe the overall result of, of the trials do not reflect any patient, because you have patients that do do no uh, ben have no benefit and patients that have a lot of benefit. So the mean result is just an endpoint for approving a drug and may not reflect any patient. There were a lot of patients, as you saw, extrophobia lesions, lesions far from the phobia, that they had thirty percent of reduction. So there are going to be patients that will do get benefit of this. There are comments this, now in the... So, sorry. This is, sorry, this, this is a bit like watching Djokovic against Nadal at tennis. This could go on <laughs> for five sets. I, I, <laughs> I, I, I just am reminded of the endarterectomy carotid surgery trials. Oh, he's off. Doing <laughs> the slices after the fact, they found that patients who were treated on Mondays, Tuesdays, and Fridays benefited. So I think, you know, when you're doing this post hoc thing, I'm going to look at this group and that group. You always have to be suspicious when the overall trial as an Oaks did not meet its endpoint. Just uh, there, there are now some, some comments from, from uh, our audience. And uh, so there's one comment and, and a question concerning how long should we follow 
um, the patients in studies and maybe the follow-up time is too short because also in PDT times in wet AMD there was a decrease in visual acuity but still the treatment group um, in the longer run uh, was beneficial. So how about a follow-up of five years or, or even longer? Do you want to make a short comment on that for both of you? Yeah, uh, this will completely depend on an individual because if you have someone who is aged but still in a good uh, in a good shape and has a phenotype who has a fast progressing and has a phenotype uh, that uh, still has preserved function, there we will be very motivated to try to make the patient to stay as long as possible. Other patients that are weaker, other patients that have a lot of other comorbidities, that their lesions have lost already a lot of vision, the lesions are large, we will not get, give them hard time. So it's we'll need to individualize as crazy uh, with these therapies, patient per patient. And whatever it is, whether if it's two it's years or five months. years, we can't be doing injections every month. Yeah. I think uh, what, we, what I've learned a huge amount from this, we're also desperate to, uh, to have an effective treatment for geographic atrophy. Um, you can come in quickly, Paolo, but we're, we're over time on this debate, yeah, but uh, please. Yeah, thank you very much, Ali, sir. Uh, uh, this was a great debate, uh, as, as you uh, saw. Uh, I just have um, a question for you, Jay. I think the very last sentence in your last slide uh, was saying that 90% of in 90 98% of cases you have macular atrophy with ante VGF with the seven up study that's what they reported so oh. sorry. if we want to start this melon I, we can open this melon but that's yeah. <laughs> no time for that. that no time for right. that okay <laughs> that's a different complete subject and that's seven up is all study right. It's the worst messaging for a seven up for. Yeah, but for even more medicine. recently, the data are like fifty nine percent, right? I mean, even other other papers have come with the most. Just, just very, very, very quickly, uh, you 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 just you you are suggesting that, that anti VGF may cause some. Uh, um... No, not at all. I didn't suggest that at all. I had it because the last time I spoke, when Jordy mentioned it, uh, Phil Rosenfeld presented this. Uh, a six-year projection of what the lesion would do, even though we have no six-year data with this drug. He showed, well, at six years, it will become that. But we don't know what will happen at six years. What we do know is that with anti vegf for example, initial results are not met with final results at six years, at seven years, both in terms of visual acuity as well as other anatomic parameters. So I didn't know whether Jordy was going to show that same expansion picture that Phil showed, and that's why I mentioned that. CMB okay. is cause of, loss, loss of vision of CMB is the main first cause is under treatment. When patients are well treated, especially, let's talk about these 30% of patients that have type 1 lesions. If you keep a type 1 lesion non-exudative for a long, long time, I have patients for 10 years and more, these patients do not develop GA because type 1 lesion behaves like a second core capillary. So at least 30% of patients that have type 1 lesion, if they're treated properly, and that's a difficult thing because many times they're undertreated, those patients have a very good prognosis long term. And I, I don't agree with you, but we don't know what it will be with a C3 inhibitor. So I encourage you to encourage the sponsor to do that study to see whether you can get away without anti VEGF treatment in those patients and then report to us. Well, but you need to maintain them. Mm -hmm. I agree. The way you manage them. The way you manage them. So, Al, I think we need another Euretina debate yes. <laughs> on complement <laughs> inhibition, and, <laughs> and we will then <laughs> continue with that <laughs> discussion. <laughs> Absolutely love the oh, sure. Thank you all so much. I love the Thanks, information. Jay. It was a pleasure. Hey, Krishna like and Jordi have been fantastic. Thank you so Jordi, much. It's great to see you all. Please Thanks, stay, Jay. stay and we can please stay Bye -bye. and you can comment on the next debate. Uh, hand over to my co-chair, Nicoletta from uh, from the Uretina board. Thank you, Nicole. Yeah, thank you, Al. So it's my pleasure to uh, announce the second uh, debate. It's on biosimilars are important treatment options for retinal disease. And we start with Ashish Sharma from India. And uh, yeah, Ashish, the stage is yours. 
Thank you, Yuretna, and thank you, Enad, for giving me this opportunity. And it's such a pleasure to debate once again with my good friend, Dr. Paolo. And I'm going to talk about that why biostimulators are an important treatment option for retinal diseases. And before I proceed further, these are my disclosures in the last 12 months. And we have been trying to understand biosimilars since the last four to five years. Various aspects related to biosimilars, whether switching, immunogenicity, and how kind of what kind of comparison in terms of endotoxins. You know, we have published on all those aspects, and this is our contribution in the last four to five years. And I definitely need to acknowledge all the people who were part of these publications, and they helped a lot to understand in this area. So uh, biosimilars, we know that they are highly similar in terms of safety, purity, potency, but they are not exact copy. So there could be some differences, but regulatory make sure that they are not clinically meaningful differences. So the question is that why do you need biosimilars? Predominantly, what it provides is it provides you cost benefit so that overall healthcare burden reduces. Now, next question is that why cost is a significant factor? If you really look at the real world data and uh, the randomized controlled trials, we have seen in all kinds of indications in retina, real world outcomes were always inferior to RCTs. And the reason behind was predominantly under treatment and majority of the time under treatment had various reasons, but one of the major reason in majority of the world was limited access to the treatment predominantly because of the cost. And once again, the testament why cost is a significant factor is that bevacizumab success globally is a testament that why cost is so significant. Then next question is why not bevacizumab then if cost is a concern? So if you really say, you know, we all know this is a wonderful drug, but it's still off label. And many countries, various health authorities, they still do not allow drug to be used. And country like us in India, you know, we do not have robust compounding pharmacies. So the system is not in place. So we have had some of the incidences of endophthalmitis in past. So many clinicians who are solo practitioners, they do not like to use bevacizumab. Rather, you know, they were looking for options where they can use a cost-effective drug in a single while. That's what biosimilars have uh, given us. And now I would straight away jump to the, you know, some of the myths related to biosimilars, which require real, real clarification here, because only then we can, you know, re really, you know, identify the potential of biosimilars. So myth number one, safety and immunogenicity is a concern. I've been part of multiple debates, talks in the last few years since Biogen has approved their first biosimilar. Every time, this is the example of India's first Ranibizumab biosimilar, which was approved in 2015, is quoted. It's quoted that, you know, you know, in the initial few batches, some of the cases, it was reported with uh, some anterior segment inflammation. I would, you know, clarify the next two slides, but before that, I would say now India has approved two more biosimilars in the last two years, and there's no significant inflammation on those, uh, both the drugs. Now, just look at the data of the reference ranibizumab from 2006 to 2009. And this is the paper that we published that, you know, safety compromise with biosimilar, whether it's a perception of truth. So if you look at the anchor data, the inflammation was 17.1%. In Marina, inflammation was 20.9%. But now there's no significant inflammation. And if you look at the data of SB11, Ranibizumab Nuna, there's no significant inflammation. Now, I'll tell you why that, why before 2015, you know, drugs had more inflammation. And now after that, why the inflammation has come down. If you really look at this, we published this data in detail in this paper. If you look at before 2015, most of the companies, they were following endotoxin limit of less than 0.5 EU per ml. 
Endotoxin consists of everything, means excipient, bacteria, bacterial uh, uh, toxins, etc. Then what happened in 2015, USFDA revised because they found that even with less than 0.5 EU per ml endotoxin limit, they had some cases with biologics where they, it could cause TOS, it could cause inflammation. So now after revising that limit to 0.2 EU per ml, since then there's no case. So the, you know, the drug Indian Renibizumab, which was blamed as a biosimilar, it was not really biosimilar fault. It was the fault of the endotoxin limit. And once after this point, less than 0.2 limit was maintained, there is no biosimilar or biologic that had this problem. And you see reference biologic was also having a lot of inflammation in the beginning. So now myth number two, biosimilars are not tested well in clinical trials. They have less patients. Just look at the data of Anchor and Marina. Anchor trial has 140 patients in 0.5 arm. Marina had 240 patients in you know, 0.5 milligram arm. So that is one trial and biosimilars, they require just one trial. Even if you combine Anchor and Marina together, patients were almost equivalent that SB11 had. Even in the control arm, this was the same case. Now, myth number three, biosimilar phase three trials have short endpoints. To clarify this, we published an editorial that why this short endpoint is very important to understand. Means we as a retina specialist, we all know that whenever we treat a treatment naive case, the maximum response that we receive is initially three to four injections. And all these biosimilar clinical trials are based on equivalence design. So you can only pre prove equivalence in the initial stages when the response is great, but later response gets blurred and it's very difficult to identify equivalence margins. Although to check efficacy and safety that is monitored throughout the study period. Now myth number four, biosimilars extrapolate approval in all the indications. Why is that? If you look at biosimilars always, you know, talk about, they take their cues from reference molecule. If reference molecule, which target the same target, if that would have shown in the past that, you know, reference molecule was behaving safety wise different in RVO compared to CNVM, then probably biosimilars would have also give, done a different trial. But it has been proven by reference molecule that whether it's an RBO, AMD, or DME, there was no safety difference. That's the reason with one trial, there's an extrapolation to all the indications. Now, if you really look at the safety aspect, just look at the Europe. Europe is the most mature nation as far as biosimilars are concerned. 2006, when first biosimilar was launched in Europe. And since then, there's no biosimilar which has been withdrawn or suspended based on the safety or efficacy concern. So education, education and education, especially for physicians and retina specialists is so important, you know, for the success of biosimilars. And I would say novel assets are much more unpredictable. For example, bralicizumab, we all know, compared to biosimilars, that emulate products whose safety and efficacy is very well established. And if we understand this, many lives can become better with biosimilars. And thank you for your kind attention. Well, thank you very much, Ashish, uh, for these clear statements. And uh, so now I'm very curious, um, how about Paolo Lanzetta from Italy will tell his truth? Thank you, Nicole. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to present in this Euretina debate. It's a great pleasure. And uh, thank you, Ashish. What else can I say? I mean, uh, Ashish, my good friend Ashish is the very expert on biosimilars in ophthalmology. As you have seen, he has published extensively. I uh, will try to touch the same issues or myths that Ashish mentioned but just looking uh, from another perspective, let's say I will try to look the other side of the coin. And uh, I will try to highlight the limits of uh, biosimilars 
Um, so by looking uh, from another side, as I, as I said, those are my financial disclosures. Uh, you have already heard about the definition of uh, what a biosimilar is. And uh, I can also add that uh, biosimilars are currently routinely used in different areas of the human medicine. And uh, as Ashish said, this may result in significant cost savings. In other words, in the possibility to treat many more patients as compared to using the uh, originators. So as regards ophthalmology, many biosimilars to ranibizumab and afliberset are under study uh, currently. Uh, when we uh, deal with bevacizumab, uh, the terminology is more complex because the products which are under investigation as uh, supposedly biosimilars maybe rather be defined as originators um, because currently bevacizumab is not approved for the opera use with an intravitreal de delivery up to today. So we don't have a, a real originator in ophthalmology for bevacizumab. Um, let's start from something which uh, has been touched by Ashish. Thank you. Uh, for highlighting how education is important. Uh, so let's look uh, to the current knowledge um, on biosimilars by the retina specialist. And uh, the situation is not very comforting because as compared to other specialties, retinologists are definitely less familiar with this class of drugs. And the majority of retinologists uh, uh, surely believe that more education and information is needed uh, on the safety, efficacy, and performance of biosimilars. Uh, 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 retinologists are also uh, seeking for some guidelines, and obviously they are also very much interested in cost issues. And I think that cost is probably the issue, as Ashish uh, suggested, and I fully agree uh, with him, with him on, on this uh, specific uh, topic. So um, there are also differences in the definition of biosimilars if you look at the different regulatory authorities and probably the most accurate de description and definition is the one by the FDA, which is probably the most uh, rigorous. And I think uh, everybody should uh, refer to the FDA uh, definition uh, being very uh, rigorous on, on this. So let's go into the very argument. Um, uh, despite the different definition from the different regulatory authorities, um, and Ashish already mentioned that uh, a biosimilar is uh, similar, but is not the same as the originator or the reference uh, product. This is very important. Uh, and that's why I'm trying to uh, look at this topic from the other side of the coin. Uh, so biosimilar, yes, they do contain the same uh, protein. They have the same posology. They have the same route of administration, but there might be some differences in the excipients, the uh, presentation, the powder or solution, and the administration device. And uh, this has a role in the cost benefit of biosimilars, including possible side effects linked to inflammation or immunogenicity. Uh, and we will cover the uh, point of endotoxin limits by regulatory uh, authorities. And as Ashish uh, mentioned, there might be some side effects in using uh, biosimilars. For example, uh, a study on a recent study on patients with non-infectious uveitis showed some recurrent inflammation after they were switched from the originator infliximab to the bio biosimilars. And what the authors hypothesize is that there might be some structural variation between the biosimilars and the reference uh, biologic, and those uh, variations might lead to some differences in efficacy and obviously in the safety profile, trying to explain these uh, inflammatory reactions. Uh, Ashish already mentioned that uh, we move into intravitreal biosimilars 
and in 2015 and 17 in India, there were some cases of sterile and with the with the use of the first biosimilar of ranibizumab, which was uh, which is named Arazumab. Um, and this was linked, as Ashish mentioned, to issues with purity, endotoxin uh, levels, uh, which were secondary to the very manufacturing process. Um, uh, obviously, um, with time, we will refine the, uh, I mean, industries will refine the manufacturing process, um, um, regulatory authorities will uh, place some limits in the uh, endotoxin uh, values, but we have to keep in mind that this possibility of um, purity issues, endotoxin issues might still uh, be uh, uh, something to consider. Uh, as I said, indeed, it is clear that a biosimilar is not a twin copy. That's important. Uh, the manufacturing process of biosimilars and originators is very complex and any variation might uh, be the cause of some alteration in the safety and possibly in the uh, efficacy of biosimilar products. Um, in this publication, Dr. Ari Prasad um, uh, says that uh, biosimilars are placed in the first analytical step. Um, um, and this means that we want to prove that the biosimilar is chemically, structurally, and biologically highly similar to the originator uh, molecule. Um, uh, thereafter, and we move to phase three clinical trials, uh, which later on will conduct to the approval of a biosimilars, uh, those phase three trials uh, uh, have a very limited follow-up and that has been mentioned by Ashish. So we don't really have long-term data on uh, safety and efficacy because they are not requested. Uh, as an example, in the pivotal trial on BioVids, which is a biosimilar of ranibizumab, the uh, primary endpoint uh, was evaluated at week eight for visual acuity and week four for the central subfield thickness. And that was enough for having the uh, biosimilar uh, approved by the authorities. Then we have another issue, which also has been mentioned by Ashish, uh, which is the uh, related to the numerosity of the sample in order for being uh, approved. And these slides compares uh, BioVids with uh, ranibizumab. Uh, so uh, a biosimilar is highly similar to a reference uh, medicine as uh, uh, comparable safety and uh, efficacy uh, in one theoropathy uh, indication. And then safety and efficacy uh, data may be extrapolated for other indications which are already approved for the reference medicine. So, in other words, this means that fewer clinical trials or no trials uh, are needed uh, for a biosimilar for expanding the indications. As a result, and you can see it here, um, BioVids was tested in uh, uh, 350 patients for being approved for WetMD, whereas Lucentis, sorry, Ranibizumab has been um, studied in many patients, more than 2,000 patients, for being approved uh, in other indications uh, uh, than uh, uh, WetMD. So uh, uh, RVO, myopic CNV, diabetic macroedema, proliferative diabetic retinopathy. Uh, on the other side, uh, the uh, biosimilar will be approved for the other indications with uh, the WetMD trial only. So this is a big uh, difference, I, I think, I think. Um, let's move to something uh, else, which has to do with some uh, uh, immune responses, uh, uh, secondary to biologic or biosimilars. And we have become more familiar with the immunogenicity uh, issues and anti-drug antibody up after the approval of the newer medication, uh, brolucizumab. So as biosimilars are not twin copies of the originator, uh, there might be some specific uh, product related elements 
uh, which are secondary to the manufacturing process, um, stability of the, of the drug, the, uh, some formulation issues, and this may contribute to the possibility of an immune response. Yes, um, um, uh, authorities are fixing endotoxin limits, but this uh, doesn't really make everything uh, free of any possible uh, reaction, inflammatory reaction, immune uh, response. So there are other issues, excipients, uh, stabilizing agents, storage media, and all the, the, of them may theoretically influence the uh, immunogenicity of a biosimilar. Uh, let's come to the price and the cost. So this is a one more issue um, uh, related to the pricing of biologics and, 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 and biosimilars. Um, as we said, biosimilars have highly potential cost savings. Um, obviously, biosimilars are required to be priced at a discount relative to their originators. It is about 30% in Europe. It is uh, possibly 50% or more in the US but this doesn't really happen every single time. So the cost saving might be less than we are expecting. And the, uh, as a practical point, I would suggest that the adoption of biosimilars in ophthalmology, in intravitreal uh, therapy, uh, beside all the arguments I tried to, to touch, um, uh, will be directly dependent on their price on the market with respect to the, the, their originator. So just to uh, conclude, I would modify the, uh, the argument, the topic to a more balanced uh, title, which is biosimilars may be a treatment option for retinal diseases, but I would add uh, some uh, uh, conditions. So uh, there is a need for increased uh, knowledge with biosimilars by the retina specialist. This is uh, evident. Uh, as biosimilars are not identical to the originator product, it's mandatory to establish robust manufacturing quality control actions. And this is already happening as Ashish uh, was suggesting. Um, similarly, strong biosimilars pharmacovigilance system should be developed and uh, established to monitor their safety and efficacy. And finally, I would also say regarding the cost that transparent price policies may increase patient accessibility to affordable therapies. And this is the good part of uh, having uh, uh, biosimilars uh, available, less uh, cost, more patients who can be treated. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Paolo. Very clear statements. And now um, it's open for discussion. And I would like uh, to, to ask uh, Ashish uh, the first question because you have been showing a lot of data on the safety. Uh, we have been talking about the endotoxins. So uh, let's talk about efficacy. I mean, the biosimilar is a biosimilar to ranibizumab. Um, in Europe, um, in uh, two months, we will have uh, a Farisimab uh, approval. And uh, so in the presence of Farisimab, um, how important is it to have a biosimilar um, of Ranibisumab? Yeah, Nicole, so basically it means the major advantage of biosimilar Ranibisumab is to give you price advantage. Mm -hmm. And the kind of price advantage that uh, it has given in the U.S. is around 40%, which is a great price. So, it means in my practice, I can give around, you know, three, four injections rather than giving two injections. So, I am in a better position to treat them better and longer. So, that is what they provide. It means Parasimab has a different action. It works on ENG2. So, it's not the head-to-head -head comparison that we can do with Parasimab. Yeah, Probably sure. Actually, access would be much more with biosimilars. Okay. There's a question from the audience, and I think this is really a very important question. Maybe, Paolo, can you comment on this? Can you clarify the difference between a generic and a biosimilar? I think that's really that's a really good question. Yeah, I think Ashish is, is the good person to answer to this question. Okay, um, Ashish. <laughs> 
Go yes, ahead. Very, very, you know, very schematically, uh, biosimilars are the um, corresponding generic when you're talking about uh, biologics. Generics are the, uh, the uh, similar drug when you're talking about uh, chemical drugs and not biologics. That's very schematically. And then Ashish, if you wanna go into more details about that, but I think this is enough as ophthalmologists. This yeah, is I will mean, just add an example. You have a paracetamol. Paracetamol have a clear cut chemical composition, you know, CH and whatever. So that can be exactly copied. But as biosimilars, they go through the, you know, biologic means they have to go through the cells so it cannot be a clear-cut copy there could be some changes so i mean uh, that's the difference one is chemical one goes through the biologic change mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you have been talking about the treatment costs um so there is also not approved uh, for uh, ophthalmology but there is still avastin available so um what what would be your preference, uh, ranibizumab, biosimilar, or avastin in terms of efficacy and cost of treatment? Paolo, you want to answer or shall I? Well, are we, are we going to have some 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 uh, prices if we do answer to this question? No, uh, I was joking. Uh, I think that it's it's going to be quite um, a complicated field once biosimilar. Uh, will be part of our armamentarium. But just to be very simplistic, uh, and this is what we have experienced during the last 15 years, cost will be a major driver, okay? Uh, let's remember that Bevacizumab, as it is now, is an off-label drug, whereas biosimilars will be in-label. And this is a major difference and this might be very relevant in some countries where uh, of the off-label use is opposed. Uh, but once again, bevacizumab off-label will be much less expensive as compared to biosimilars. And this, once again, might be a driver in some places, in some countries for using bevacizumab off-label. We've got um, a, a comment, uh, a question, and somebody's pointed out that Zivifibacept is highly cost effective and licensed. Um, what's the experience with that? So Zivifibacept, again, I think for ophthalmology is an offerable drug because we have uh, had few cases which we treat. It's very difficult to, you know, import and get it. Avastin is much easier to get it. But again, that off-label, you know, question comes again. And I think that's a, it, this is really a very, very good uh, comment um, from the audience because um, CIF aflibacept, to my mind, is not a biosimilar of aflibacept because no. it is no. a completely different compound. It's used for IV injections. And as I know, it makes much more inflammation than the aflibacept or any other ranibizumab biosimilar would do. So yeah, does anyone have yeah. any experience with that? Well, that's the oncologic formulation. Exactly. Uh, some experiences have been published. Ashish, I think you, you published something on that, did you? No, I, th I think my good friend Jay published on that. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, but it's an oncologic formulation. Uh, bringing it to for uh, the intravitreal modality is quite difficult. It's uh, opaque, it's not transparent. Uh, so. That's why it, it is not really popular uh, as much as Bevacizumab has become popular. I have a question to Al, actually, because um, I, I think that uh, on Gavia, this uh, FYB201 will f or has already been approved in UK. So UK is the first country here in Europe uh, where you actually do have the spire similar. What's your opinion? Will you use it? How will be the UK approach? Well, <clears throat> I, I, I can't specifically answer that, I'm afraid. I, I did like Ashish's um, uh, graphic on the, the objections or the, not the, the barriers to adoption of biosimilars. And one of them, it, it struck me when I was watching that, is that so much of our medical education um, has to be funded by pharma. 
in terms of getting messages across and the biosimilars don't seem to be a, have the marketing budgets in the same way to promote things. So I think that this is a big barrier to uptake um, of many things. And uh, in the UK, we have the added examples of NICE approval, which uh, we need in order to get it into the NHS, which is 80-90% of our healthcare environment. So it, it becomes very difficult for new drugs uh, to get into the market, so to speak, until they're NICE approved um, and for us to use. So the, the, the recognition of this uh, is is a, merely a start um, before before it starts to 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 be widely uptaken. Great, I could uh, ask a lot of more questions, and I think it's really a very interesting topic. Thanks to both of you, Ashish and Paolo, for mm -hmm. covering this theme so brilliant. And I would leave the last words to our president of Uretina, our chair, Alistair. Um, uh, to say goodbye. <laughs> well, well, thank you, everyone. We've still got 100 people uh, listening live. We're up with around 200 at one point. I, I've learned so much uh, and really enjoyed it. We've had a great, great tennis, uh, if you like. Um, thoroughly enjoyable. I'm hoping that everyone listening is going to be coming to Hamburg in September, face-to-face -face conference. We're making a big, big effort to put on a good show. Uh, and we've, as you can see from tonight's debates, we've got great speakers uh, who are engaged with your retina. So I thank you very much again, both the audience, the speakers, and my co-chair, Nicole. Thank you, and good night. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank you very much.